And we're back with uh, Jason Horsley. And this time, Peter has fixed the audio. Or Peter Peter has called out that the audio had an issue, and, and Jason and Peter fixed it together. And uh, so this is uh, Jason Horsley on, on KubraCon, uh, the Redux. Uh, it was funny when Apocalypse Now came out, uh, they called it the Redux, and I don't that 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 name kind of got injected into the the Sinosphere. I don't remember another redo called a Redux. I'm not sure about you, Jason. No, I don't know. I don't know what that was all about. And it wasn't uh, even as good as the the original Apocalypse Now either. So maybe we probably shouldn't use that term. No, yeah, well, per, per, yes, perhaps not. Uh, yeah, it's interesting uh, that it wasn't as good because uh, I have seen, I've, I'm kind of an Apocalypse Now nut, uh, and I have seen uh, the original uh, studio release version many, many times. And uh, I did see the Redux, and I didn't get it. Uh, I didn't, I, I, you know, the French plantation scene and the, the Playboy bunnies and stuff they, they didn't really add that much and and it did almost cost uh, coppola his marriage i think well the movie the original movie or the redux well the um so i know this because i used to work at a camera store which you might remember from hollywood called sammy's camera which was kind of like the big professional camera store and uh the guy that i worked with was a guy named larry carney and Larry was uh, the sound man for Coppola's wife. Uh, Coppola's wife was shooting the behind the scenes making of documentary uh, when uh, they were making that movie. And uh, so he told me the story that um, uh, at one point uh, she knocked on the door of his trailer uh, with a crew, with a, a camera operator and a, uh, and a sound man. Uh, because she wanted to surprise him and interview him about something. And uh, he was indisposed with one of the Playboy Playmates uh, when, when the door opened. And so that obviously caused a lot of um, yeah. problems on the, on the set with the movie, with the Playboy bunnies and all of that other stuff. And so um, a, a large part of the Playboy bunny scenes that were filmed didn't make it into the final cut. And I, Larry thought that that was probably part of part, part of his trying to save his marriage. I see, I see. <clears throat> well, he said that the man who made the Godfather movies died in the Philippines jungle, not relating to this incident, but just to how harrowing the whole experience was. And of course, movie history in quotes has confirmed that, as in Coppola never again made a movie as a standard that he maintained in the 70s. So that would explain why... Uh, the Redux, I mean, anyone could have known, including Francis, that the Redux was going to be worse because he wasn't the same Francis Coppola, clearly he didn't have the same, you know, uh, aesthetic judgment. Anyway, we're talking about movies in a very conventional way. Indeed. Well. <laughs> in, in, indeed, and so maybe we should dive back into the whole Stanley Kubrick of it all. And, and your thesis, for people who didn't watch the first video or who, who couldn't hear the first video and uh, for people who haven't read the book yet, which I highly recommend Kubrickon, uh, uh, Jason's uh, thesis is that uh, not only are Stanley Kubrick's films part of some kind of uh, global mind control operation, but the, but the concept of Stanley Kubrick as the uh, genius filmmaker uh, that all other filmmakers should emulate uh, is also part of that uh, psyop. Um, and uh, th that kind of dovetails neatly, I think, with a lot of uh, Michael Hoffman's hypotheses about the kind of uh, global mass mind control uh, mechanism that, that Hollywood uh, uh, seems to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's interesting because... Uh, uh, I was, I was taking notes. Let me see, um, and and I, I thought that a good place to start would be. I'm looking at my notes now. Uh, was the was the whole idea of MythMakers? We we were talking about Apocalypse Now, and uh, Apocalypse Now. 
you know, famously uh, uh, was a project. Well, I don't know if it's famous or not, but when I worked at Universal, I worked in the producer's building at Universal. And my friend Mario one day gave me a copy of the original screenplay for Apocalypse Now that was written by George Lucas. And it was terrible. Hmm. Um, it, it's, it was like a bad episode of Magnum P.I. Um, and uh, it started off on a boat in Marina del Rey. And the entire movie is a flashback um, of a guy telling his story about what happened to him in Vietnam. And, um, uh, you know, that combined with things like Howard the Duck, uh, which was a movie that followed Star Wars. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that Lou Wasserman so disliked American Graffiti that he was trying to sell it to ABC as a movie of the week. Uh, before it was released in theaters, uh, you know, makes me uh, question the whole kind of Kubrick, uh, Spielberg, Lucas, uh, Coppola, uh, 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 idolatry, Hollywood idolatry. Like these guys are all put up on pedestals. And uh, it, it does make me wonder whether or not uh, that all of these things are kind of part of, of of the same program but kubrick is really kind of like the poster boy right he was the 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 trial balloon the the one that they they started the project that they worked on first um, um so i don't i don't know if there's a question in there or not or if you have a comment uh, well starting with your um summation of initially i was relieved oh good he's gonna He's going to sum up my thesis so I don't have to, but, and I still don't want to, uh, because it's, well, that's why. It hurts, right? That's why authors write books, right? So that it's down and then they don't have to memorize all that stuff, at least some of us. Uh, and it took, you know, 60,000 words to really unpack it. You know, it's a very complex thesis. Uh, and uh, last week we talked, uh, not last week, but last time we spoke, we talked about, I talked about, um, trying to bridge the gulf between the popular view of movies and cinema and the almost equally popular but opposing view uh, of it being a big mind control thing. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's not really equivalent in popularity, but in today's you know, post-YouTube culture, it's certainly got legs. I mean, there's probably millions of people who know what you or I mean if we say Hollywood is a psyop or a mind control operation, or think they know what we mean. And um, uh, but <clears throat> those two worlds don't, they seem incompatible. And so, and as I mentioned last time, the people who do, including myself, I don't tend to. This is kind of the point I'm trying to get to. I tend not to. I try to not oversimplify or crunch things down to just easy quick phrases like mind control operation or, or and so on precisely for this reason um that even those of us who are aware of this and think we know what's going on and, and are talking about it we still like yourself said uh, you have this thing for apocalypse now we still as uh, subject to the power of movies we still have favorite movies and like when you were just saying about the Coppola Lucas Spielberg Kubrick thing I wanted to part of me wanted to say well not Coppola because you know the Godfather's actually really good and but right but I can't do that I mean I can I think it's necessary this is also part of my point it is necessary to try and be objective and say well okay you can look at obviously you can look at Howard the Duck but that's low-hanging fruit but you can look at certainly a lot of Spielberg's work, or you can look at Coppola post-apocalypse now, and you can see whatever else was going on at this deep level, this psyop social engineering level, there's also this more surface level of uh, people making movies that are varying degrees of quality. Uh, and it's important not to lose sight of that. Although, very essential to say, something being a work of art, which I think The Godfather is, or Jaws for that matter, or uh, what, who else are we talking about? Not so much Kubrick and nothing by George Lucas. Um, it, 
that doesn't make them less effective for these for as part of this style um but it it's, it's important to, to tell the difference. We did talk about this last time, the different kinds of propaganda. So anyway, about the summing up the Kubrickon thesis, um, although nothing you said, and it was, you gave a soundbite, did I disagree with? Because I I think I know what you mean by those things. And Michael Hoffman, I think, is from what I know about his work, is, is good at what he does and probably right about a lot of it. Despite all that, Kubrickon, in my view, is a book that's written in such a way that even a um, Kubrick scholar or somebody who's ensconced in the ordinary view of Kubrick might at least get to the end of it. I don't think that they would be convinced because I think that's, that's a bridge too far, but it's written in a certain language that attempts to, you could almost say, rehabilitate these ideas of PSYOP, but it's not that because it's, it's, it's to try and ignore those terms that have become popular. Um, and, and approach it from the point of view of somebody who has no clue about any of this or they're completely skeptical uh, because they're not convinced and uh, see if it's possible to make it coherent within that framework. So, for example, um, I don't talk about mind control directly in the book. I might talk about it in terms of some of his films being about mind control, obviously, quite current. Um, but I don't talk about the Kubrickon or this this overarching agenda that was using Kubrick and his work for mind control, quote unquote, in those terms, but rather in terms of, for example, attention capture, which is a kind of trendy term now that intellectuals are talking about. And I think it's closer, it's got more nuance to it. And, and the thing about mind control is there are many moving parts there, like what is mind control? Like those of us, who know about mind control slash believe in it, we're mind controlled, number one, and we don't necessarily consider that. And number two, we probably don't think we are mind controlled and, and in that sense don't believe in mind control. You, know, you might notice that there's this contradiction in people who talk about this stuff. They rarely talk about it in terms of actually how they're experiencing it and how they're trying to get free of it. They talk about it as if they were free of it, which indicates they don't understand mind control. It's so subtle and it's so nuanced and it's so insidious. Well, yeah, well, it, it's interesting. Uh, so I, I've been working on my own book for over a year uh, right now. The, the working title is Reframing Reality. And uh, one of the things that I started to do uh, when I started working on my book was to study hypnosis. And the interesting thing is about hypnosis is it's based on suggestions that are made in, to people's psyches while they are in a trance. And... Uh, a, a trance is defined as an alpha state. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, people go into alpha states all the time. Uh, there's uh, the, m most people watching this can probably remember uh, driving their car someplace and thinking about something while they were driving their car and then getting to the, the destination and, and not remembering the trip, like not remembering the, the fact that they were driving there at all or, um, uh, and, and movies have, the ability, good movies have the ability to put you into a suspension of disbelief state. And when you're in that sus suspension of disbelief state, you are in a trance. Uh, it's you, you, you have to be able to see Maverick and not see Tom Cruise uh, to be able to uh, get the full experience of the movie. So uh, motion pictures uh, by design are a, a kind of a, a hypnotic process. And so my uh, so my thought on this is that um, uh, uh, it, it's all about defining. What, and once once I learned what this definition of of hypnosis was, then I started catching myself kind of in my daily travails, you know, uh, finding myself in trances and thinking about things and understanding that um, that I'm putting myself into a suggestible state. And reckon, to your point about uh, about people not wanting to admit or think about the mind control or the fact that they are mind controlled. I mean, is Michael Hoffman a psyop? You know, is 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 uh, is Peter Duke or Jason Horsley a psyop? Like, are 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 we out there in order to? Uh, are we being put out there in the world in order to 
forward this meme that there is a mind control uh, industrial complex and that uh, and that we can get lots of people to, uh, to think about that. Uh, you know, that's it's kind of an iterative or a, a self-reflective uh, uh, idea. But uh, to your point, if you understand that we're kind of in an influence environment where you've got all of these different types of influences that are approaching all the time, uh, I guess what we're talking about is intent, right? Uh, we know that the intent of an advertiser is to get you to buy the product. Like we take that for granted. Uh, we don't uh, know that the intent of a motion picture is to get you to believe that they're aliens or to get you to believe that uh, that, uh, you know, some other some other idea that fits a bigger agenda that other people are talking about. Hmm. Um, uh, to answer a couple of your points, though, about about the whole, I, you know, you know, I was talking about Coppola and you said, Oh, not Coppola. And, and the, and the thing is, is that, uh, one of, one of the things that I write about that I'm writing about in my books is the idea that, uh, you know, there's this idea of the, of the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. And I think that, um, the elites, uh, the people, uh, who I hypothesize are con in control of things, uh, they look for excellence. You know, they, they don't pick Spielberg and Coppola because they're not good at what they do. Uh, they they might have had a leg up because of somebody that they were related to or somebody uh, uh, mentioned them in passing. Uh, but there is a, a, a sorting mechanism in Hollywood. Uh, you, you do. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, reminded of a guy that I met once named uh, Michael Lehman. Michael Lehman was the receptionist at Zoetrope while Apocalypse Now was being made. And uh, famously, he made a, a hit movie called Heathers. Uh, he was the director of the movie Heathers. Yeah. Uh, but then he followed it up with a movie, a, a Joel Silver movie. And uh, Joel Silver, if you look at the kind of full flight of the arrow of Joel Silver's career, he did uh, uh, you know, all of the Matrix movies and uh, 48 hours. And I think that he was probably the first producer in Hollywood who produced over a billion dollars worth of films. Um, you know, if you, if you look at uh, the, the next film that Michael Lehman did after, uh, after Heather's was Hudson Hawk with uh, Bruce Willis, which was a famous flop. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've never seen the film. Uh, I like my, I, I met him. I, I, I spent uh, uh, a couple of hours uh, taking his picture one day and I thought he was quite a, uh, a, a nice guy. And, uh, uh, but that, that, that flop effectively finished, uh, his major film career. Like, I, I think he still has a career, but he, ne he's never made a movie with a budget like that again. Sure. Um, so, so there is a, so there is a process. And so you, if you get to the top of the unfinished pyramid, the way that I look at it is that, uh, uh, based on your skill, uh, then you may get a tap on the shoulder and get asked to participate in the in the bigger programs with the bigger budgets. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about your comment about Coppola is that um, the mechanisms that I talk about and that I'm writing about in my book, uh, I got from a, a spook uh, that I used to work with. Uh, and he gave me this acronym, which was uh, MICE. And MICE stands for money, ideology, compromise, or ego. Um, the one that they leave off is uh, family uh, for obvious reasons. But this is an acronym that intelligence uh, operators or uh, handlers use in order to, to create assets and to control their assets. And one of the things that happened, I think, uh, I'd have to look up the date when... Uh, uh, Coppola lost his mojo mm -hmm. uh, was his son got killed. Uh, it, was uh, bit, it was a bit later, but yeah. yeah. Um, and his son got killed uh, with uh, Ryan. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Ryan O'Neill's son. Ryan O'Neill's son. Yeah. Ryan O'Neill's son was, uh, was driving the boat. So 
you know, that's a real kind of, it was a, it was a horrible accident. It was almost, uh, the way that it was described was almost cinematic. Um, the act is a horrible accident. And, uh, and, you know, Ryan O'Neill's son was, was driving the boat. So, uh, you know, p- part of me looks at that and goes, was that somebody sending a message? Sure. Right. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know that that, I don't know that to be true, but those are the kind of questions that go through my mind now. Because once you have the mice framework in your head and you're going, well, is that money? Is that ideology? Is that some kind of a compromise? Is that ego? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what is it? And, and that's usually the answer when somebody uh, has one set of behaviors that uh, has some kind of an inflection point and goes off in another direction. Um, my thesis is that uh, there's usually uh, some kind of component of mice or or family that's being applied at that point. Sure, sure. Well, um, one of the problems, I mean, maybe the central problem for me, at the risk of repeating myself, is is that um, how much do we have to uncover here, prove to our own satisfaction, or speculate about? before we'll turn away from the spectacle and stop in different ways investing in it. And I presume because by looking at myself and observing my own internal responses and my own continuing habits, like I'm still reading about Hollywood because it's a habit. Like a, a lot of those books behind me are about Hollywood. I just read a biography about Robert De Niro. I got no reason to read that biography, although actually I did find it. I mean, maybe there was something useful in there in a way. I'm talking about it now, but that's certainly not why I was reading it. I was just reading it because, you know, most of the time I'm reading about the Bible and I'm doing some deep stuff, but I do like to do light reading because I find it relaxing and entertaining, but I also find it energetically draining. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is is um because of this like i'm still after all of this i've still got this fascination for hollywood which is actually i presume in fact i know and anyone who reads 16 mats of hell will have a sense of this or listens to the audio but that my fascination in to some degree has been compounded by the growing awareness that what's going on in hollywood isn't what it seems uh and the reason isn't just that it's fascinating to read or think or talk about Hollywood and what might be going on and speculate and look for clues. It's not merely that, or I don't think it's even primarily that. From my point of view, it's that the cognitive dissonance remains that I can, I, I, there isn't much to do it on Robert De Niro, but I remember reading on that Crazy Days and Nights site that during some of your viewers may know about. Do you know about that site, by the way? Crazy yeah, I, I, I do. I have, a, I have a friend who sends me screenshots of it regularly. <laughs> okay. But you still got, you know, there was a rumor that it was Robert Downey Jr. and whatever, I don't suppose it is, but whoever it is, uh, I don't know how reliable it is. But anyways, this is an example. I mean, I did, I think I, I referred to it a little bit around Kirk Douglas and the alleged rape of Natalie Wood, which I think is pretty much solid from my impression, it seems that it's backed up by family members and stuff sufficiently that I include in 60 Maps Hell. Around Robert De Niro, was the idea that he and Scorsese were having sex with, with very young girls around Taxi Driver, um, which seems perfectly plausible. They were certainly in that world and they could, you know, you know, we know that De Niro is a very thorough method actor, although Travis Bickle didn't actually have sex with Iris. But anyway, that that that's one of the only things I remember uh, coming across about Robert De Niro, uh, but then I haven't looked for Dirt, but but the point I'm trying to get to is is that I keep returning to this, you could say my own vomit, um, around this because because I um, I haven't really reconciled it. I haven't really reconciled the tension between the two uh, points of view. Primarily, I presume, because the, 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 the original viewpoint that Hollywood is a place that creates great movies. That, okay, it's corrupt and there's bad things going on there. And, so, and the artists end up not a shadow of themselves. You know, even as a teenager, I would have started becoming aware of that. Uh, but essentially, it's what it seems. And th- th- that viewpoint was one that I, I developed very early on, you know, in my adolescence, even pre adolescent. So, so the, the things that the, the points of view, the perspectives and the beliefs that we 
adopt at a very young age, they're hard to get rid of. Like one can spend decades actually um, trying to undo them, but because they went in such a deep level, we might not be successful. So um, I, I don't know if this is exactly where I was going, but this is why I keep kind of talking about it in this indirect way, because I think we can talk about examples till the cows come home, but that people need to realize again it's like back to the mind control the way mind control controls us it's not the way we think it is it's we let it in and we think it's something good and because it's controlling us we still think it's something good so so we can talk about mind control but then the examples we'll use will all be things that actually aren't personally directly controlling us not really, like you could talk about military propaganda in the movies, for example, but most of the people talking or writing or, or making movie, documentaries about that, they didn't end up, you know, jingoistic military uh, advocates, right? They're, they're immune to that particular. Or, or, or maybe they did. I mean, the, you know, famously, I think Top Gun, uh, the, the United States Navy basically... Uh, uh, shelved its marketing budget for new recruits for a couple of years after the first Top Gun movie came out. Yeah, no, I'm not uh, saying it doesn't yeah. work. I'm just saying yeah. that people like Matty Alford, who I've actually hung out with, because uh, he's British, um, and Tom Secker, you know, the guys who are looking into this, there's this documentary, this, this is a war that somebody mentioned in the comments to our last chat. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, those people probably went, you know, they went influenced by Top Gun. They probably thought it was a pile of shit when it came out, as I did. Um, so it seems more, it would be more relevant if those people were researching the propaganda, as I've done, that's affected them, which means you look at your favorite movies. You don't look at the ones that are, that are more obvious. Um, yeah. Right. Well, well I, 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 and I have been doing that. Uh, I don't know if you follow the work of, uh, of uh, Alison McDowell, uh, but, you know, she started off a couple of years ago just wanting to research uh, uh technology and education and yeah i, did. I, I was getting know. confused with andy mcdowell the whole actress yeah. and i talked to Alison for a podcast yeah, yeah so uh uh you know and she t I, i'm trying to remember what the point was that i was going to make about Alison mcdowell oh um technology. no it's but yeah. something else i I, 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 it, it, it will come back to me. Uh, the other thing, if I talk about this other thing, I'll remember what I was going to say about Alison McDowell. Uh, oh, about our favorite. We were talking about our favorite. The, we're our, looking our, at the things that we don't want to admit, actually. Right. So for, so for example, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan is one of my favorite films. Oh, and Alison McDowell pointed out the other day that Star Trek uh, is basically Fabian socialism with a holodeck. And I actually have a, uh, it's, it's right up there. The, it needs a new battery, but I, I have a Star Trek II Christmas tree ornament. And when you push the button, it's Kirk and Spock. And, uh, and they're talking about how uh, the good of the many is better than the good. It, it, sometimes the good of the many is be, uh, uh, worth sacrificing the good of the one. Or I, I can't remember. It's Marxism. Basically, it's 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 uh, Kirk and uh, and uh, uh, and Spock talking about Marxism. Now, the, where where somebody might argue that in that scene, uh, Spock has volunteered to give his own life in order to save Kirk and the ship, mm -hmm. but 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 in reality, is that really a choice? Because if he doesn't do it, they're all going to die anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So. So, uh, uh, so when Allison, uh, when Allison said that uh, Star Trek is just uh, Fabian socialism with a holodeck, it went through me like a spear, like it hurt me. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if Doug Lane heard that. I think Doug Lane was a guy I used to work with, uh, and he, he was big on Star Trek. I think he even went to write a book about it. But then he's leftist. He's a Marxist himself, so maybe he would acknowledge it. Um, but I was going to say something more about this. Uh, oh, I know what it was that because I've done this myself and maybe even I'm still doing it to some point that there's this point of view um, and this would bring us more to Kubrick uh, if we wanted to that 
even if something is propaganda, we can still, and I'm not disagreeing with this view, but I think it's important to bring it out or worth bringing it up. Um, even if something is designed, say Star Trek is favoring propaganda, we can still kind of sort the seas and we can find other meanings in there that weren't necessarily intentionally placed there. But you could even say, I mean, I could even add the rationale for this because we're in a sentient universe in which, you know, everything is consciousness and that works of art aren't simply the products of the minds or the corporations that create them. Things get in there. And I, ha I do happen to agree with that. But I think it's a slippery slope. I don't know about synchro mysticism, but there's this whole movement that did to some extent converge with the Kubrick um, exegesists uh, that, that basically approach movies in this way. And what, what, what really got my goat about the synchro mystics, they're kind of gone now, but there was a period where they were, they were quite prevalent, was that they would take this approach, but at the, at the expense of including the fact of what, what you mentioned, the intent. The intent is, is, is essential. You don't want to just leave it out. So yes, you could watch a movie and find that there are meanings in there that weren't intentionally put there and that uh, may have some personal benefit for you, like if they arrive at exactly that right time, despite the fact that that movie really is a Trojan horse for a military industrial entertainment complex that, that wants your soul. Like the two things aren't mutually exclusive. But if, if as in the case of synchromistics, you're leaving out the fact that this is also propaganda and that in fact your your religion, your your hobby is is to watch corporate propaganda till the cows come home to you know like looking for uh, jewels in a cow trough kind of thing or a pile of cow shit uh, then you've fallen for a kind of higher level trap which is what i think we talked about last time with the kubrickon or kubrick's work is that many of the people who are looking at kubrick now they think they're doing it with a critical eye um but actually, <laughs> the exorcism doesn't really involve Kubrick usually. But even so, even if it did, um, they're, they're still giving their attention. And in fact, more intensely and more comprehensively and more in terms of more time and more intensity, I repeat myself, more obsession, obsessively than, uh, you know, ordinary critics who, who just talk about Kubrick being great because they're actually taking Kubrick movies as sort of Rosetta stones that are embedded with information about the universe and the soul. Well, I say bullshit because, I mean, by that, or, or at least from a broad uh, perspective, one could study anything. Gurdjieff said this, actually. If you look deep, and not that I'm advocating Gurdjieff either, but... but <laughs> It was a valid point. I think if you go deeply enough into anything, you'll start to get a sense of how the universe is constructed or the metaphysical layers of reality. Uh, he wasn't talking about holographic universes or anything that, like that. But I think just the quality of attention, if you really give your attention to something, you immerse yourself in it and you will start to discover things that you didn't suspect that were there that were clues to your own nature. Uh, yeah, you, you're. Uh, um, oops, you're, did I drop out? Yeah, you dropped out a little bit, but we can edit this. <laughs> uh, well, what did you catch? Uh, what was the last thing? What was the last thing? Um, when you're giving so much attention. When you're giving so much attention to something. Right, you can't. That you can have epiphanies and so on. Right. Uh, but but still but you, you, when you when you give enough attention to to something uh you can find the universe in that thing that you are putting your attention in. I mean, the universe by definition is everywhere and god if we want to get theological by definition is everywhere but and but therefore surely we'd be discerning about what we give our attention to if you can give your attention to anything so so then the t to the, the second thing is the intent. Like, if you're going to give your attention to Kubrick movies, why? Why are you picking Kubrick movies when you could be learning how to keep bees, for example, and, and tuning into the secrets of the universe that way and making honey? That's obviously a very valid question. And the answer, simple answer is, well, it's easy to sit and watch movies. It's not easy to learn about bees. And then the second thing is, is what you said about intent. Is there an intent behind these movies that you happen to think you're smarter or smart enough that you can study them and not get trapped, 
which again I right. call bullshit. You can't. I know I can't. I've written books about this stuff, and I know I'm not smarter than the social engineers, right? But I'm trying to. I'm I'm actually trying to come clean. So I'm using myself as a case study. Look at me. Look how smart I am. Sorry if that's immodest, but I think my books testify that I've got a pretty rigorous uh, intellect and I know how to use logic and all that. But I'm still a sucker for this stuff. So. You know. Yeah, no, it's it, it's interesting because it reminds me of a story. I in 2006, I was working as a consultant for AFI and Microsoft and something that they called the New Media Workshop. And I was the representative for the guys and the people in Redmond had a budget, but they didn't have anybody in L.A. who could go and do the meetings. And so I worked for Microsoft uh, and supported the American Film Institute. And, um, and it's like your confession, isn't it? Every time you confess a little bit more. Yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I have this very kind of forced gump like, uh, resume. I, I, I've, I've been in the room in a lot of places that, uh, in retrospect, I, I probably shouldn't, shouldn't have been in that room. I don't know why I was in that room in the first place, but, um, but I, we had developed technology that would allow you to put a disc into a computer and, and see a movie. Uh, and and then pull uh, metadata about that movie from the internet uh, to be able to make the movie a, a richer and deeper experience. That was basically the the program that I was in charge of. And um, at one point we went and we had a meeting. Uh, the 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 guys from Microsoft and I went and had a meeting with the president of Home Entertainment for Paramount Pictures, and we were pitching him on all of this. Uh, 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 technology. And he said, why are you, why are you, why are you guys trying to sell me on this? And, and Microsoft, by the way, was willing to like fund all of it. Like it, we weren't asking him for money. We were asking him to basically partner with us on something that uh, Microsoft would pay for. And we told them that we wanted to make a, a better home entertainment experience for people who bought Paramount uh, DVDs. That was basically it. And, um, and uh, he gave us uh, w what was one of the most enlightening kind of uh, responses that I'd ever had from any Hollywood executive ever. And he said, he said, you know, I would do that, but it's not really worth it. And we said, well, what do you mean? And he, and he started to go through, he said, I spent a million dollars on marketing research last year. And what I found out about DVDs is that most people don't watch them. Right, they keep them and, in their wrappers even. Right. Uh, and yeah, and he went on to explain that uh, the number one reason why somebody will buy a DVD is because they saw the movie before and they they had a good feeling, you know, they had a good date that night or, you know, uh, it, it, it made them feel good. And they they think that they want to watch the movie when they buy the DVD, um, but they take it home and they put it on the shelf. He said a lot of people like to impress their friends with the movie, with their repertoire of movies that yeah. they uh and so they like to have those things on the shelf and he said uh so people will buy dvds for a lot of different reasons uh but watching them uh doesn't seem to be the most important one right. and uh and and that kind of that that was another kind of like uh moment where i'd spent a you know we had spent obviously a lot of money and a lot of time coming up with what we thought were really good ideas for people who liked movies and the guy who was in charge of selling the movies to the public d didn't think that people cared. Mm. Uh, uh, and he's probably right. <laughs> uh, well, it reminds me of when I was 20. Uh, I had a small apartment in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I consciously, I mean, I said to my sister or whoever, that I was going to turn the apartment into a representation of who I was. And, and the way that I went about doing that was putting images on the walls uh, of all the different Hollywood or musical icons that I worshipped, of course, Spade and Spade, that I identified with or identified with, with being a fan. Like, this is my taste. This, these are my values, right? And, right. and that included a... A wall of the VHS videos, all these movies, which I did watch over and over again. I didn't ever have them without watching them, but I certainly did 
enjoy the fact that anyone who came around could spend a while browsing. I mean, look right now, I've got all those books behind me. I didn't do that deliberately. I just ran out of space. So I had to put those books there. And I figure it's a reason. I, I, have, a, I have a shelf here with books on it that wasn't the, in the last conversation that we had. So uh, uh, these are books up here see. too. Yeah. yeah, Can't see them. And certainly can't read the spines now. No. But yeah, this is this is this kind of throwback to that time because I was uh, I was conscious of which books I put on this particular shelf because hey, they're going to represent who I am, kind of. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I don't believe that, but there is there is part of all of us, I think, if we're cultural, you know, creatures and we're, we're products of our culture to that extent. That I mean, it's all it's Facebook. It's all Facebook's all about that. Like you've got you know your different yep. faces favorite this and favorite that anyway this is what seen and not seen was about which is the first book in the series of my books about social engineering cultural uh, programming mind control if you want to call it that uh, and that was specifically about my relationship to certain movies and how when i look more closely at it for example clint eastwood movies it was it came very clear very quickly why I was drawn to Clint Eastwood and those movies, the kind of needs that they met in me that related to my personal trauma, uh, absent father who was six foot four and had a big Clint Eastwood kind of smile and a, a brother who bullied me. And, you know, Clint Eastwood obviously is a guy who stands up against bullies. He's there, he's tough, he's mean, dirty Harry. And uh, even Fistful of Dollars, like his first movie, he even intervenes to rescue a family. So it's really, it's actually quite clear, it was once I started looking at it, that my love affair with Clint Eastwood, which began my love affair with movies, it started with Clint Eastwood, um, was a, a direct uh, response to a trauma that I was unconscious of and therefore unable to address or heal, uh, that Hollywood um, had exploited. Obviously, they didn't target me, but they, you know, the people behind, right, I, behind the movies, they know the kind of psyches that are out there. Yeah, I think you talk about that in, uh, I'm, I, I've, I've, I've gotten a few more chapters into 16 Maps of Hell, and I think that you talk about that in 16 Maps of Hell. Um, at, at, at one point, again, I, I, a lot of my experiences that I have is because I was a photographer. And at one point I was working, well, I had a lot of friends when, when I lived in the apartment on Poinsettia Place uh, and my uh, roommate was friends with Quentin Tarantino and uh, Lawrence Bender. Uh, 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 you know, there were there were there were a lot of, you know, different influences that came into my life. But I was a photographer at that point. And I was a hustler. And one of the people that I worked for ran kind of there there were acting schools that i knew of uh i i think uh the baron brown studio joanne baron is kind of famous for uh being the uh the uh the acting coach for a lot of people who have won academy awards and all of the people in my personal sphere were in this baron brown kind of acting uh school sphere uh, but there were other acting schools um that, and i used to make a living uh shooting headshots uh for these acting schools that would basically take anybody that showed up in hollywood that said that they wanted to be an actor uh if they had a ch if they if they could pay for the lessons they would uh continue to uh take their money whether they had any skill or not and uh and so i used to uh, shoot headshots. And I, I didn't feel guilty about it because I knew that at least the person was going to get the best photograph that they could get. Um, whether or not they were ever going to make it as an actor, I, I wasn't sure. But uh, I was sitting in the office of this this uh, this acting school uh, one day talking to the woman who ran it. And she said, uh, she said, you know, there's something like a million people a year who come to Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. to make it. And most of them last a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there's, uh, it, it wasn't until she said that to me that I realized that there's an entire industry uh, in Hollywood that centers around the myth of Hollywood. So it centers around that kind of Grauman's Chinese walk of fame Hollywood, which is the tourist Hollywood, as, appo as opposed to the uh, Burbank, Century City, uh, Culver City, 
uh, production end of Hollywood where movies are actually made, movies and TV shows are actually made. Um, they kind of, you know, praise on that idea that uh, there, there are lots of people who movies speak to uh, who think that they are destined to do this because they have created such an emotional uh, uh, connection to it. Uh, you know, I got into this whole thing. I got into all of this mind control stuff because I was I was a fashion photographer. Well, people in New York would have called me a clothing photographer, <laughs> but I worked with all of the same people. I worked with the models and the hairdressers, the makeup artists. And I, I was wondering one day when I was pushing the button, why if I push the button one time, somebody will buy a sweater. And if I push the button another time, they won't. Like, what 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 is it? about me looking through this camera that is attached to that finger that's pushing that button that's saying, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that, that kind of led me, led me into this. But eventually, um, you know, before it was movies, for me, it was fashion. Uh, you know, I always, uh, the same way that you looked up to movies, I looked up to, you know, Vogue magazine and, uh, the photographs that were the fantasies that were created for uh, uh, in still images. And still images are interesting because a motion picture, you have to spend, you know, an hour and a half to have it have that kind of impact on you. And arguably, it's probably magnitudes greater. But still photographs have an impact on you immediately. Like they, you know, they you look at a photograph and you make a decision, it goes straight into your reptile brain and you, you say, I like that, or I don't like that. You have some kind of a reaction to it or you don't, mm -hmm. but it happens instantaneously as opposed to a song, which you have to listen to for a few minutes or a movie yeah. that you have to spend several hours watching. It has corresponding, I don't know exactly, but I'm just thinking this, thinking out loud, but the corresponding, power if it takes longer and i think again back to clint eastwood that when i first fell in love and i think there's no other term for it and mentioned the transference from my father so i mean that kind of love i don't mean a sexual love um it, i was watching the movie where eagles dare with my brother and for the first maybe half of that movie, I couldn't tell the difference. There was only 12 between Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood. But I did know the names. because, uh -huh. And I kept asking my brother, which one's Clint Eastwood? Which one's... And he kept telling me which one was Clint Eastwood. But at a certain point, not only could I tell the difference, but by the end of the movie, I was completely enraptured by Clint Eastwood. And so... Yeah, how long did that take? It took the, the length of a movie to really instill or imprint me with my Clint Eastwood fixation, which right. which is continues to this day. I mean, I can't I can't watch Fistful of Dollars without feeling a similar kind of thrill at watching Clint Eastwood. It's, it's that's how deep it is. Um, so yeah, there's the movies as we touched on. Uh, I think you mentioned it anyway that movies one of the things that we know movies are trying to do is persuade us to see the character and not the actor which is known as suspension of disbelief and of course central to that or inseparable from that is to pull you into the story so that you get carried away by the story and forget that you're watching a movie now what i write about this in 16 months of hell what happens then or not then but what that is describing essentially the, the immersion in the narrative is we insert our consciousness into the story so we become fully identified with whichever character we're most supposed to identify with probably but certainly whoever you know sometimes there's an ensemble like dirty does and i remember i loved john cassavetes i wouldn't have known the name but he played franco or something like that and i absolutely love franco he gets shot right at the end um and just as the last point because i can see you already jumping at the bit when i first no, got, keep going keep going I, I first, I've, I've, I've written down what I want to say. When I first got fixated on Clint Eastwood, I mean, soon after, when I was sort of developing an identity around this, my first go-to was, I, I want to be a cop in San Francisco. I want to be Dirty Harry. It was only right. 
took a few months probably to think, well, wait a minute, I don't quite see that this is, right? It, it did, the shoe didn't really fit, so I wasn't going to try and go to that ball. So then I started writing film reviews and I, because I, I kind of knew I wouldn't be an actor either. Like I had to recalibrate enough. So it became, first of all, it was I want to be Dirty Harry. Then maybe there was I want to be Clint Eastwood, but I'm not sure I might have just skipped over that. But then it went, so I want to be, I want to know Clint Eastwood. I want to be somebody Clint Eastwood's going to work with. And even somebody who tells Clint Eastwood what to do, I want to be a film director. Right. So that, that shoe fit well enough. It didn't fit because obviously I never meant, but that I sustained that fantasy for, for 20 years. Well, actually, I've been thinking about making a movie recently, so I'm still not free of it. Anyway, I think the most essential point here, which overlaps with Kubrick on and 60 Mets Hell is the way that attention capture, the way that movies work is inseparable from being abducted as you know, a level of consciousness into the narratives that are created. So it's like a, like we now know with video games, movies were already doing that. It's just video games became, it was more you know, visible and on the surface what's happening is that you're, you're an avatar, you know, you, you're, you're having yeah. this avatar created for you and then you're putting on your virtual goggles and all that, and you're getting Im imported into that false reality. Yeah, it's it's interesting too because uh, uh, that that does happen and I wonder, well, I have two thoughts. Uh, the second is about subversiveness and so I'm saying subversiveness so everybody will remember that that's what I was going to say. But the... Uh, the kind of sidebar that I wanted to start with is the idea that uh, it's interesting because there are certain actors, uh, uh, male actors specifically, uh, that are kind of famous for playing themselves. And I, I think that Clint Eastwood is is kind of one of those actors where uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how much uh, you're seeing on the screen is actually acting or Clint Eastwood just playing that Clint Eastwood guy that Clint Eastwood always, always plays. Well, his and, physical presence, sure. Although yeah, just, just, just the way that he presents things. And I'm, I'm reminded of two stories. One is um, uh, Charlie Sheen uh, was making a movie that uh, Clint Eastwood was directing. I, I can't remember which one it was. The Rookie? The rookie. Yeah. yeah. And was that written by Boaz Yakin? I think it might have been. I'm not sure. Um, uh, who's another guy who used to sleep on the floor with Lawrence Bender and Quentin Tarantino in my apartment. Um, but, uh, uh, the Charlie, uh, was a method. He styled himself as a method actor. And so, uh, uh, he had spent, uh, uh, a lot of time trying to figure out this character. And, uh, before, they started shooting. He came into Clint Eastwood's office and he said, I want to talk to you. And Clint said, what do you want to talk about? And he goes, well, I want to talk about my character. And, uh, and Clint goes, well, what, what, what do you want to know? And he goes, well, I want you to know how I, how you think I should play it. What you, how you think I should do this. And Clint said to him, and this was, uh, as I remember an interview with Charlie Sheen telling the story, Charlie said, uh, what Clint said to me is, he said, I, I want you to hit your marks and say your lines. And if I have any notes for you, I'll let you know. Um, and listening to you tell your story about Clint Eastwood, it makes me think even more that Clint Eastwood is just, this is how Clint Eastwood does what Clint Eastwood does. He hits his marks and he says his lines and he waits for notes. <laughs> um and and when you're directing yourself, I don't even know how you do that. Warren Beatty famously said, uh, uh, "If you're," he, he said, uh, "Acting is like having a physical relationship with another person, and if you're uh, directing yourself, it's like it's 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 like having a physical relationship with yourself. It's it's not that satisfying." <laughs> right. Uh, um, well. I was going to point out about Clint Eastwood that there's a biography of Patrick McGilligan, which has a lot of dirt on Clint Eastwood, not a pleasant character. But one of the things that's, re that's relevant here is apparently he's he wasn't a, he's not a confrontationalist, so he would he would uh, get rid of people and you know betray them or, or, or stiff them, and, but he would never do it to their faces apparently, or very rarely. 
And that's actually the opposite of the Clint Eastwood. So obviously, dirty Harry. Yeah, that's it. That, that that is interesting. And I've heard that. I work for Spielberg, and I've heard that for, about Spielberg too. Like, if Spielberg doesn't like somebody on the set, he doesn't say anything about it. They're just not there the next day. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yes. So then it's something else that's going on. I mean, even that idea that Clint Eastwood or Gary Cooper or these guys that they're just being themselves. That's part of the myth for sure. I mean, Cary Grant famously said, you know, nobody can be Cary Grant, even I don't know how to do it. Uh, but these these characters, I mean, Cary Grant is a very different kind. Of, he really was a, a skillful comedian. But these guys who just know how to show up and hit their mark and somehow exude this presence, they have some, well, they have this magical quality of charisma and the confidence that comes with it, largely to do with physical bearing. And that if you watch the spaghetti westerns, that's really a great deal of what Clint Eastwood's doing. It's just the way he moves physically, the sound of his voice. He doesn't have to act. He's got this incredible presence. And to, so to be able to do that on camera, like the ability not to be self-conscious, which now that I'm saying it could be a, a, a symptom of sociopathy, I'm not saying it is, but it would be fairly consistent. Um, that is, is a rare thing. And, uh, I mean, I would say that that's that's closer. So, so somebody like Clint Eastwood, they mar they master a way of being in the world through the power of of movies. Like they're they're a movie star, so obviously that, or they're on the verge of becoming a movie star. That gives them confidence. They can pretend to be someone they're not. Tough guy with a poncho and a cigar. Uh, if they're not self conscious about that, which can be a sign of lack of intelligence, uh, as much as anything else, then. And, and of course, the more it works, the more it works, right? The more they can convince people. Um, so I would imagine with someone like Clint Eastwood, obviously he can he can show up. He doesn't have to do much directing of himself because he doesn't need directing um, and maintain that. But when it comes to actually man in his real life, of course, and I've, I've observed this more closely with the John Deruta, the guru that I wrote about, Dark Oasis, uh, who actually looks a little bit like Clint Eastwood, that if you ask the people who, who will get close to somebody like this, you get a completely different story, precisely because they're close. And so whoever it is, they can't maintain that spell. You can't maintain the spell if somebody's seeing you take a shit and getting up in the morning and getting irritable when your computer doesn't boot up, like all these ordinary human things. Right. They break the spell pretty quick. And once the spell is broken, you you lose right obviously it's this back back to this larger theme of say kubrick if if you can create a consensus slash spell around uh somebody whether it's an actor or a director or ho the whole of hollywood that spell itself uh it's also what you two were talking about was hypnosis um it's actually a way of harvesting the energy of the audience and that gives the power to the thing that's casting the spell, and so it can continue casting the spell. Right, and that and that's that's I, I think Michael Hoffman's point um, is that is that you have to look at this whole thing as as a uh, as a, a a ceremony, right? That the the audience goes in, and and I think Carl Jung said the same thing too. Uh, that the, the the audience goes in and they're quiet and they are inducted into this um, uh, spell, like you said, uh, uh, and 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 something happens. And and to to bring this back to Kubrick, um, uh, one of the I I live in the Pacific Palisades, which I just recently found out was also known as the Weimar of the Pacific. Uh, because this is where all of the German communists who wound up affecting the Hollywood screenwriters wound up living uh, uh, in the 1940s when World War II started. So Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno and uh, Edward Marcuse. Uh, Edward Marcuse wound up in San Diego, but um, they were all here. Thomas Mann and uh, 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 Bertolt Brecht. Um, and and uh, one of the things that I've been researching lately is that it, what, that the big and Aldous Huxley, uh, who uh, who lives on the same street that Steven Spielberg and J.J. Abrams live on now, um, Aldous Huxley. Well, he's dead though. 
Yeah, but I'm saying that he, oh, lived, he did live where they now. He live. he lived where they live now, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh uh and close to Tom Hanks and Matt Damon and and uh Ben Affleck and um but the uh but the point that I was going to make is that uh the uh the thing that they seem to have done and we talked about this in the last uh in the last uh, uh episode was uh, that they created this sub, uh, this subversive cinema, and you famously you, you talk about uh, John Huston, uh, uh, where you basically cast uh, good guys doing bad things or bad guys doing good things, uh, in order to create this kind of uh, 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 dev divisive or uh, uh, I, I would argue that it causes a kind of a schizogenesis in in the audience. And bring, bringing this back directly to, Ku, to Kubrick and Spartacus, Spartacus to me uh, seems to be a recasting of the Jesus Christ story as a human. That is, uh, Spartacus, and, and, and there's a subtext to it. And the subtext to it is that slave revolts don't end well. Um, and uh, you wind up getting nailed to the cross and you may be resurrected and reborn because you had a child and your widow gets to shirk off into the dark with your child. Um, but but there is no a kind of uh, Jesus Christ style redemption at the end of that movie. And it reminds me of of what uh, uh, I I hypothesize is happening with Shakespeare too, which is where you're taking, you're putting people in situations that normally would have been relied on some intervention from a higher power in order for them to be able to come to terms with it. And instead, uh, they are left to their own devices. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but there isn't a lot of divine intervention going on there. And uh, it seems to me that one of the uh, reoccurring themes that I see happening um, is this idea of uh, recasting, uh, uh, I, I think of Lolita, uh, which was another Kubrick film, uh, which Lolita was a book that I loved. Uh, I, I have the annotated Lolita. I love Alfred Appel's asides. I love all of the introductions of lepidoptery and butterfly hunting and all of the other stuff that goes along with it. But um, Lolita is a film that I don't think that you can make without a voiceover. Like it, the, the first entire half of the book takes place inside Humbert Humbert's or Umber Umber's head. Uh, and the reason that it's kind of a laugh out loud, funny book is because of the things that he thinks of, which is not normally something that would make a good screenplay. It's not something, uh, you know, John Sayles famously says that you've got to think in pictures. Um, and if you want to make, uh, if you want to tell a story about what people are thinking, it's better to write a, it's better to write a book or, or, or do a play uh, than, uh, than do a movie. But Kubrick did wind up doing Lolita and uh, I, I thought it was terrible uh, uh, having read the book. Uh, and then when it got remade years later, uh, I think Adrian Lynn made it. Um, and I thought, Oh, well, here's an opportunity for somebody to do a voiceover movie and make a funny movie. And nope, he just basically redid the same trope where it winds up becoming a pedophile movie. Um, instead of a movie about the, uh, I, I guess where I differentiate between uh, pedophilia and what I see as funny in, in Lolita is that um, because all of the uh, ironic situations that Humber got himself into were in his head, that is, he wasn't actually doing anything uh, until the exact, uh, uh, half of halfway through the book. Um, uh, it, it, it's funny. And I think that most people could relate to the thoughts that Humbert was having in his head. Um, and 
uh, bringing this back to subversive cinema, uh, the idea of Lolita uh, being a subversive book, that is putting the ideas that all people have in their heads out on display in public is kind of a subversive idea in and, in and of itself. I don't think that it was done well in the movie Lolita, either one of the movies Lolita. I do think it was, I do think it was a great book. And I do think that Nabokov may be the best American English writer out there. And considering that American English was like his fifth language, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, but uh, bringing this back to subversiveness, it yeah. seems like there there is this reoccurring theme of trying to, uh, and we in Hollywood we call it the twist, right? There's always the the twist where it isn't it, it isn't this way; it's actually that way, and the i and the idea, I, I guess the big idea of subversive cinema to me is getting people to doubt their own perceptions when they walk out of the movie theater, like it it doesn't matter. Um, uh, what your Christian beliefs are. If you walk out of Spartacus and you think that was a good movie, are you subversively thinking, well, maybe Jesus isn't going to save me? Uh, when you walk out of uh, Lolita, do you think, well, maybe pedophiles are okay because everybody thinks that way anyway? Uh, do, do you know what I'm saying? There, there, there are uh, really kind of... Uh, subtle meta uh, themes going on in, in these movies that I think that do wind up, uh, you, you know, you, you put somebody into uh, a, a trance state and then you make a suggestion. It goes into their unconscious and that they may not even be thinking about it consciously later, but it, it may wind up having some kind of impact on them. What do you think about that? Well, I was trying to determine while you're talking how you're using the word subversive, because initially, because you were saying you admired Nabokov, it seemed as though you were using it in the more common vernacular that subversive art is good art, but by the end it seemed that you were talking about something that you didn't approve Right, of. right. Well, maybe Nabokov is one of those guys like you like you are with Coppola. Maybe I'm, that's, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm admiring something in Nabokov that I, uh, on, in retrospect, uh, I shouldn't be because he's done such a good job with his craft. Uh, well, sure. that, I could yeah. go. I could. I was considering going there. It's very specific. But Vice of Kings, if you if you get to it one of these days, uh, has a chapter on Nabokov, not specifically his history, not, but it's how in, well. it's in my pile. There it is. Uh, how well he and Lolita fit into the social engineering programs that I'm mapping there. So, yeah, you're prepared to be disillusioned about Nabokov. However, I think that the larger subject is, and, you know, my view is very cynical and a bit too simple-minded, really, is that if you've heard of him, then he's probably working for the social engineers or her, not necessarily consciously, but he was deemed useful. I got that. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. K. Dick exegesis behind me, and I don't think Philip K. Dick was was with the program when he was alive, but but by now he seems that he is because he's been he's been adopted by the superculture, and you know Philip K. Dick is is really like a very important player in the cultural landscape. So it's very nuanced. It's very hard to say, um, you know, if there's any way to avoid. Uh, being co-opted by the superculture and still reach people? Probably not. I, but anyway, that, that wasn't why I wanted to zero in on this subversive question because uh, there is some confusion in me as well, uh, partly because, you know, I grew up thinking that subversive was a compliment, that all good art was subversive, and that the, what was being subverted were... Um, you know, the predominant values that, that were enslaving us, including, you know, I was raised an atheist. So back in my teenage years, I considered Christian values to be, uh, you know, bad, negative. I certainly don't now, but I still have um, this ambivalence about whether something can be subversive in a good way or not, you know, whether there's, an, there's, there's a place for subversion. And of course, I think there is because we're in a satanic system so right we got to get out of it but 
So then the question is, what's being subverted? What's doing the subverting? Uh, what's the intent again? And what's being subverted? And um, I mean, you, you kind of ended on a much larger point, which is that movies cast their spell. I and mean, we keep circling back to this. And while you're under the spell, like a hypnosis thing, they will implant these, these post-hypnotic commands or well, I guess they're during the hypnosis, but they become post-hypnotic commands. When you right. come out of the trance, you're st you've got them in you, and then you'll respond. Like product placement is the most super, su super superficial equivalent or example of that. But there's these much deeper ones whereby, uh, as, as again, seen or not seen is very much about this, how many of the values that I adopted only semi-consciously from my adolescence on, which is the period in which we um, consciously shape an identity. We're consciously trying to create an identity by identifying with certain figures, artworks, books, music, actors, etc. cetera. Um, uh, most of those values, they did come from outside of me, or all of them really, uh, and, that, and I, can, I can trace them. I can, I can look back at that period um, I even look back at books I wrote later, like Blood Perks, where I was still more fully under the spell, writing about the movies I admired. And I can see, oh, well, I adopted that. And I had Polanski, Clint Eastwood, uh, Talking Heads, David Byrne. Like, there's a there's fairly, it's quite a long list, but it's still, you know, wouldn't take that long to list them. Um, and then I can look at those more closely and, um, you know, what, what were they doing anyway? But the larger point is, is that even if, if some, maybe not many, some of those were did have um, positive subversive effects, as in they were helping me to see through some of the the values that I had adopted even prior to that and question them, like you know David Byrne being autistic, being weird, fear of music great album there's lots of things there that made me think and t to this day i still feel there's there's little epiphanies i can have thinking about that album uh that probably you could say that i was I'm probably better off for discovering that in a certain way and that it gave me some clues into busting the spell that had already been cast but to what extent it's like you use a nail to drive out a nail and then you just get the next nail stuck to what extent, did, it's also, we talked about maybe last time about the second matrix, like there's this whole other uh, sort of narrative frame that is there waiting for us if we start to try and get free of the, the primary one. Um, and so it appears subversive and it is apparently subversive again to, uh, it's like the king's opposition, you know, the king creates right. a opposition and then recruits all the people that might actually cause an uprising they have no idea they're actually still working for the king uh, in the sense that they're letting themselves be identified it's like that so so you might think that you're getting free but actually you're just falling for something else and and i would say that that's pretty much inevitable if if we're finding our, our, our guidance our clues our inspiration in the culture you know sorry to be so down on it but i do tend to have and it's almost it is compatible with a christian viewpoint that this world is a satanic realm and it's run by satanic forces so pretty much everything that's going to come to our rescue it, it's going to like a protection racket it's going to have it, it first of all it set up the thing that we need rescuing from and then it comes to rescue us and and there's there are hooks you know, and, and snares in the fact that we let ourselves be rescued, like I said about Clint Eastwood. So so the larger point that I, I wanted to get to is subversion to me is subversion of the soul, subversion you know, as a negative. Um, right. Subversion of the soul, subversion of the life force by which we unconsciously um, forge allegiances and alliances with things outside of ourselves and even Christianity and religion can and often is this whereby we essentially give up our autonomy we give up our interior spaces to something we think is going to inform us in a way that's positive but actually it never is I mean really like I found some really good teachers in this life well a couple anyway but I still had to the cliche is if you meet Buddha on the road kill him I still had to reject them <laughs> Because the because I'm it's not it's not coming from the Holy Spirit 
to use the Christian lingo, it's not coming from my soul. And that's the only currency. Sorry, it's turning into a bit of a speech, but no, 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 it's a, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's the only currency that really that we can trust in um, that will set us free. Well, the truth will set you free. There you go. I'll end right. on, a, on a you know a reliable saying with the proviso, of course, that you know that's come to us through the culture that itself. That there's a trap in the Bible too, but. Obviously, we can't, you know, we're not in a vacuum. So we're very selective. Okay, it's a very simple thing. The truth will set you free. But can you find it? You know? And where do you find it? Like, it's not the X-Files. We don't find the truth out there in some FBI uh, basement. We find the truth within. Uh, and, 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 the, and to find the truth within, you've got to get all the junk out that's been put in us. So it's a very, very tough well, long and hard is the road out of hell. There's another another saying. It's a very tough thing. Like you, I find you have to end up rejecting everything, all of your idols, all of your influences. Yeah, no, no, I, uh, I, I, I agree. I'm reminded of uh, when I was when I was young. Uh, my father was a physician, and uh, 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 and I worked in a I worked in a camera store before I was ever a photographer. And uh, people who work in camera stores. Uh, back the, the joke in the 1960s is that doctors kept camera stores open because uh, doctors would always come in and buy the most expensive cameras and then they never knew how to use them and they never took pictures. But um, my father was a good photographer and uh, he took, but he signed up for this correspondence course that was called the famous photographer's course. And uh, it was a correspondence course that whoever put it together, had talked Richard Avedon. Uh, of course, as these words are leaving my mouth right now, I'm thinking this is probably a money laundry in the 1960s in order to funnel money into these different people. But the photographers were Richard Avedon and Irving Penn and Bert Stern and some of the biggest uh, names in the world. And I still have my famous photographer's course binder with the Richard Avedon uh, chapter in it on how to shoot fashion photographs. And it's what I used uh, in order to start my career. And uh, so it was, I was 15 or 20 years into my career. And uh, I was renting a studio one day in Hollywood and Richard Avedon was renting the studio next door to, uh, it was a big complex, right? Where we had different, uh, basically each studio was like a stall. And uh I was shooting at night and Richard Avedon was shooting during the daytime. So uh, I asked the studio manager uh, if he, I, I said, I have this Avedon book. Would you get it signed? And he goes, oh yeah, Avedon signs books for me all the time. So I left my famous photographer's course, correspondence course book um, uh, to be signed. And when I came back to the studio the next day, uh, the studio manager told me that uh, uh Richard Avedon's reaction was so bad that he was afraid that Richard Avedon was never going to rent the studio again. Uh, uh -huh. That he was so he was so angry uh, uh, when this book was presented to, to him to sign that uh, that that he screamed for like ten minutes at the guy, uh -huh. and um, and it was it was interesting because that was one of those moments where I where one of my heroes turned from this kind of deity like uh presence in my life to kind of a schmuck you know um and it was uh i was i i never thought about it i i still have a a shelf full of richard avedon books i i i do look at his work differently though than i used to look at it because he was kind of famous for these very stark white backgrounds and uh uh with with with, with no uh i'm sorry there's a car alarm going off in the background. I don't know if you, you probably okay. can't hear it. Yeah. Um, and I can hear it. That's the problem. Um, anyway, Richard Avedon uh, was famous for doing these kind of uh, uh, photographs where he claimed that they are not about the light. They're not about the background. They're only about the subject. And what's what's interesting is years later, I found a picture and he always used to talk about during World War II how he worked in the Merchant Marine. And the way that he tells the story, it's kind of like, well, were you a sailor? Like, 
you know, were you on a boat? Like, what were you doing in the Merchant Marine? And it turns out that what he was doing in the Merchant Marine is that he was shooting the ID photographs of all the sailors. And it, it wasn't until years later that I saw a Merchant Marine ID photograph from World War II that it occurred to me that he's still shooting Merchant Marine ID photos. Like, like a, a lot of his work has the same aesthetic as that. And what he did is he took this ID photograph aesthetic and he brought it, you know, to mainstream editorial. And then because he was anointed uh, as one of the, uh, uh, the the cultural icons, everybody just accepted this aesthetic the same way. There's a there's a a, a guy named uh, I'm trying. To, it's hard for me to think with the car alarm in the background. But there's a lately in the last ten years, there's been a a, a type of fashion photography that has been uh, coined uh, porn chic. Uh, which is basically the flash is on the top of the camera and the person is up against a wall. And uh, this was known in the 1970s as bad lighting, right? right. But, but now it's chic because it's been anointed, you know? And, yeah. uh, and, and so to that end, I, I am also refactoring a lot of my heroes. I am refactoring a lot of the things that I thought of as being important I mean, when I started taking pictures of people who had wrong think, um, the New York Times did a, a profile on me and called me the Annie Leibovitz of the alt-right. The only thing I was doing was taking good pictures of people who they thought were bad people. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it was a clue. It, it, it opened me up to, uh, to being able to understand that maybe some of the things that I had taken for granted before are not exactly the way they are. But to your point about bees, I mean, bringing it back to bees, uh, 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 there is perfection, uh, or, 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 or I guess wabi sabi. There is, a, there is a, the, the attempt to achieve perfection in beekeeping seems to be a, a noble and laudable uh, uh, kind of uh, activity. Uh, as opposed to trying to figure out what the most subversive thing that you can get away with is. Interesting. That dovetails with <clears throat> one thing I was just thinking about, which was, uh, was writer David Thompson saying that he was talking about somebody, I forget who, Charlie Chaplin maybe, uh, that he was a guy who would, who, who would do absolutely anything to get what he wanted. And then he had the, in parentheses, um, which is as good a definition as genius as any. And um, so I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about beekeepers. Well, they don't get any credit. Like there are no celebrity beekeepers because I mean, there's nothing really uh, uh, titillating. Well, maybe maybe, oh, maybe, there, maybe uh, there should be. Maybe maybe that's how we save the world is uh, by creating celebrity beekeepers. Sure. Well, no, because it's like, it's, it's, uh, like the whole thing of celebrities is the problem, right? It's part of the problem. Right, yeah. It's never going to be part of the solution. Um, but this is to a point that I brought up last time, I believe it was, or maybe it was an interview I did since last time about Kubrick, that, um, what was it? Now I've gone and, I've gone and lost it. Um, uh, well, I can, I can talk about bees. And, and, <laughs> and hope it comes back. Uh, no, it's very, very close. No, no, it, it it will come back. Did you talk to Alison McDowell about bees? Uh, no, because it's interesting. Because uh, 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 jumping back to chap for, first Chaplin and then bees, yeah. but uh, uh, it's interesting because I was reading a book uh, Orson Welles. I'm fascinated by Orson Welles because I think that Orson Welles was being groomed like Kubrick, yeah. but uh, and that I think that the uh, the Citizen Kane movie was basically, I don't know if it was Henry Luce or who was behind uh, uh, him being steered in the direction of making that movie by, uh, by Mankiewicz. Uh, but that was a, I think that that movie was just a hit job on, on, uh, on uh, right. William Randolph Hearst. Yeah. Um, but uh I was reading uh, something about Orson Welles the other day, and he was talking about how he was on the set with Charlie Chaplin because he was working for Charlie Chaplin doing something, and that uh, and that uh, Aldous Huxley and uh, Bertrand Russell showed up one day, 
uh, on the set of a Charlie Chaplin movie. And I thought, well, that's, that's a very, that's a very interesting group of people. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that was my genius comment and bringing it back to bees. Um, there was a book written by Kevin Kelly, uh, who was one of the original editors of wired magazine. He might've been the founding editor of wired magazine. And he wrote a book called out of control. And in that book, uh, he, uh, he likens, uh, the idea that the beehive is actually the organism that the bees themselves are not the organism, that they're kind of a subset of the organism. And what I didn't realize when I was reading the book is that this is kind of like the scientific justification for communism, right? For that, that the state, that the state is the highest form of intellect, that the individual is not the highest form of intellect. Um, and I was wondering uh, uh, if you and Allison had talked about Kevin Kelly, because she, uh, she calls it the uh, uh, mining our consciousness using the internet in order to uh, uh, in, in order to collect all of our behavior in order to feed it into some kind of AI to create some kind of semi sentient golem as it were. Right, uh, well, that's the Kubrickon Kubrickon thesis. Yeah, in a nutshell. I didn't I didn't talk to Allison about the Kubrickon because I wanted to talk about her stuff. Um, this point, I think there is a uh, there's a way back to my unfinished point around this, which is um, there's, there's a kind of paradox or seeming contradiction which uh, Jacques Ellul talks about in Propaganda that uh, a culture that um, essentially uh, is mass oriented. Uh, always raises up individualistic heroes. Like th that seems incompatible. You would think that a culture that worships individual heroes would be an individualistic kind of culture in which which creates individuals, but it's actually the opposite. Right. Uh, and so this brings us back to this point about celebrities. Is this whole idea of a celebrity, or not just the idea, but the the function of a celebrity is by definition to give something for the masses to worship and identify with so they will never feel the push or the drive or the pull uh the natural uh impulse to become individuals to di discover their own individual orientation so um and those people the people who become celebrities uh yes they're selected to some degree by by the state in quotes so whatever we're going to call this you know this thing, this kind of amorphous hidden force, but it's, there are groups, you know, that are organizing it. Um, that they are selected, but they're selected for certain qualities. And besides talent, one of the qualities I think is this thing that David Thompson kind of Riley Riley commented is is um, compatible with what we think of as genius. And I took about it in Sixty Mounts of Hell as the art of imposition about Roman Polanski specifically, somebody who's willing to do absolutely anything to get what they want. Now, that that is something that we unconsciously admire and somewhat consciously, right? So, uh, and the, the less kind of, um, less autonomy we have, the more we will want to live vicariously through somebody that we see does have autonomy, the more we will admire that because that's what we want for ourselves. But it's a double bind, if that's the right word, or it's, it's just a trap. Because, of course, if we're busy living vicariously through somebody we admire because they're living the way that we want to live, we're not really emulating them. We're not developing our own autonomy thereby. We're giving up our autonomy to worship this heroic figure or to you know admire this heroic figure. Um, so uh, I can't remember where I was going with that. But I think it also... It was kind of it, but I thought I think it also relates to trying to include everything now. But why you got flack for taking pictures of the wrong kind of people? Because these are the gods of today. Like the, the celebrities who get photographed by the celebrity photographers, they have they're the gods. So if there's any sign that they're not godlike, we have to tear them down. That's really essential. Right. So I mean, it's it's complementary. If you raise 
people are, individuals are, then you have to scapegoat others because the, I mean, this is more going into more subtle uh, nuances here, but I'll go there anyway because it's it's really relevant to the larger thing that the heroes that we're worshipping or the geniuses that we admire, they're really not, it's not by virtue of talent, it's reminding me of this other point about your photographer, that, that they're just people who found a particular skill they have and been able to ruthlessly exploit it in a way that they'll get admired for it. And it's actually, in some cases, as the example you gave in Kubrick, um, it might even be a weakness. There, that guy actually didn't know how to take any other kind of photograph. He thought like Andy Warhol. He thought, well, how can I turn this into a, something that will actually, see, that's the art of imposition, that's spell casting. He's like, well, right. actually, I'll never really be able to do anything that's really valuable, so I'll just turn what I can do, I'll turn it on its head and make it seem really unique and people, and then maybe it'll work. So the real art of that artist isn't the photography or Kubrick, it isn't the movies, it's the ability to persuade people that what's actually a weakness or a lack is a strength and it makes it very individual and very unique to that person. And so then they, they've assumed through the art of imposition, this power within the culture and then that's the thing that unconsciously we're admiring is that they've pulled this trick. They've got away with it. We want to do the same, but, uh, well, we're, we're never going to do it as long as we're admiring this person for the wrong thing. We're not even going to realize. And so that cognitive distance is mostly unconscious. Well, the people we think are heroes are actually not heroes. That creates the need to scapegoat others. Uh, for every Harvey Weinstein, there's a George Clooney who, who gets out of it unscathed, but is doing just as evil shit, right? But you need to you need to burn Harvey Weinstein to make sure George Clooney gets away clean, right? It's, it's just the way it maintains itself. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. The sociop the sociopathy uh thing that you were talking about earlier uh, uh ring, rings rings true to me. The the I was uh I was driving when my daughter was young. I was driving her to school one day. She was probably uh, 13 or 14 years old. And uh, we were talking about Kanye West. And I said to her, I said, um, I said, I, I have a question for you. And she said, what's that? And I said, um, is Kanye West's genius his music? Or is it his ability to convince everyone that he's a genius? Yeah. Um, and she thought about it for a while and she came back and she said, I think it's his ability to convince everyone that he's a genius. Um, and I think that that kind of speaks to what you're talking about, that um, someone like, uh, the, what's the, guy, the photographer's name? The, the porn sheet guy's name is Terry something. I can't remember. And he's another one of these terrible people who has kind of Harvey Weinstein like uh, uh, rumors that swirl around him all the time. Uh, and the, the reason that he's a successful photographer is because he gets anointed by someone like Anna Wintour, you know, who says, you know, I, I've decided that y you are the one. Absolutely. Um, and that's and a power. And obviously that's a big power in itself that is increased if they can do that. Like if they, if I can, this is like the cliche or not the cliche, but apparently lawyers, they have this inside thing which any any anyone can convict a guilty man it takes a really good prosecution lawyer to convict an innocent man that's apparently <laughs> saying in the legal world um it's like that if you can make a total nothing famous then you've really shown that you're a kingmaker right? king makers are greater than the kings but it's sustained obviously the kings have the visible power so to a large degree as a kingmaker you only have power as long as you're creating the kings because then they're right there mm -hmm. you're in their good graces right but it's that whole system i mean it's so it's again we talked i think i mentioned last time near the beginning that the, the fish don't recognize that they're in water because they don't know any different it's so hard to realize uh until you have and it seems that you must have had many direct experiences of this do you have a direct experience of it that we are in a, a club a supercultural club 
but where where the guy well you 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 got higher than me you were taking pictures of celebrities you you slept on their floor and stuff they weren't celebrities at the time but anyway for whatever reason you forest gumped your way into that world and maybe out i never did as 16 maps testifies to i could never get any of these guys to answer my emails um and i you know i recently recently really kind of the penny dropped I won't go into the details because you know we've been on for a while already. But the uh, a certain publisher, but none of the ones I've written for apparently, um, they get all their books reviewed by the major press, even though they're a very small publisher and they've only existed for a couple of years. And it was just seemed indisputable that obviously the guy who created that publisher knew the right people. And ding, 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 you know, all those boxes get ticked. But that, so that's the whole thing that there's a, and I, I, I say this in Prisoner Infinity, that actually if we were to see history more um, accurately, we might discover, and but the history of culture as well, the cultural, the way the culture is shaped, we might discover there's only a few dozen main players, actually. Right. Uh, but they, they're kind of in everything, one way or another. I mean, they're often because they're front people, like Kubrick is one of those few dozen, but there's all these other people behind Kubrick who created Kubrick. We never get to see them. So obviously it doesn't really mean there's only a few dozen people shaping history because that's the sort of broad stroke conspiracy theory. It just means that in vi visibly, you, I mean, you see the names just keep popping up when you dig into stuff. The same names, Gregory Bates and Aldous Huxley, Bertrand Russell, whoever it is. It depends right. On thing, right? They just keep popping up. And they're the, but they're the famous ones. Um, and they're the king. Right. Kings. Right. And, the, and, and, the, and everybody's got a boss. Right. So the people that they're that they are working for ostensibly uh, are invisible to most people. Well, I, um, I would say the forces that they're working for are literally invisible, actually, at some point. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hear you and, uh, and, and I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, uh, but getting other people to understand that, uh, well, that's their journey, right? We, we all have our own journeys. Uh, mm -hmm. You've had your journey that's taken you to where you are, and I've had my journey that took me to where I am. And I found you, uh, thankfully, uh, from watching Sean Atwood one day. And I'm, I'm certainly uh, uh, glad and happy to have uh, found your books. Um, and uh, uh, my my wife uh, slash producer, who's sitting off screen, is also a, a, a big fan of yours, and uh, and so. Uh, and, and it's interesting too because uh, your your books, as well written and well researched, uh, and as readable as they are, they do have a tendency to go into places that people don't want to go to, right? Um, and uh, and so uh, it's kind of a testament uh, to your ability, I think that. Uh, uh, you know, my, my wife said to me a couple of days ago, she goes, we really, you know, we're re we're reading, we're almost finished with, uh, uh, a big book right now. It's actually two books by David Wemhoff called, uh, uh, John Courtney Murray, Time Life and the American Proposition. And it's about the CIA and Time Life's subversion of the Catholic church by mm -hmm. David Wemhoff. And it's very good. Um, and, but we desperately want to finish that book because we have all these Jason Horsley books that we want to get to. So, um, so uh, it's a, it's easier to read than that one by the sound of it. Um, it's a, he's actually a pretty good writer. No, I didn't uh, mean just that. It just sounds like it would be a lot of why well, she vice the Kings is full of facts and dates actually. But yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I, again, uh, the, the, the main player in the book, is who's somebody that I didn't have a lot of visibility, didn't really understand how powerful a person he was is Henry Luce, yeah. um, who was the, uh, the publisher and, and creator of Time Life, Inc. And uh, I have a, I don't know where it is. Uh, it, it occurred to me the other day that um, William Randolph Hearst, getting back to my Hearst Luce thing, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, William Randolph Hearst was a nationalist. Like he did a lot of terrible things, but 
at the end of the day, he was an American nationalist. And I do believe that uh, if there's a thesis that I've got for why somebody like Henry Luce would want to take out somebody like well, William Randolph Hearst is because Luce was essentially a globalist um, and right. that uh, and that Hearst was a nationalist. So hmm. uh, uh, I think it's, least- it's a good uh, general point that I'm going to extract from that is, is that really is infighting. Like there are there are kings and there are kingmakers and they're not all on the same party not that it's political parties but you know different you know uh, cartels let's say there, there certainly is plenty of infighting and we you know as on the sidelines we don't it, we have to just speculate deduce hypothesize observe you know where that's happening uh, as opposed to just assuming it's all even because the, the, there seem to be shared agendas in the sense that uh, both or however many factions more or less want the same thing, but they want to get there first, right? So right, exactly. I, I it's, e- it's it's easy enough to say that the world is run by bankers, but if you understand that there is a Rockefeller faction and there is a Rothschild faction, and that they uh, may all want the same end goals, but they want to be the one sitting in the seat calling the shots, then. <laughs> Then, then a lot of this stuff is. Uh, I guess is, thank uh, God, thank God for us, because if they <laughs> if they united, uh, it'd, be, it'd be even more formidable. I suppose. Ex- ex- exactly, but um, but uh, 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 to that end, uh, 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 if you believe in Jesus Christ, uh, then there then there is a happy ending supposedly. Well, someone <laughs> pointed out our crosses. I was going to point that out as well during our conversation but i didn't get to but somebody in the comments mentioned that we both have crosses behind us um that does remind me of where i was hoping to get with all of those points that i kind of spewed out at the last minute the which was the soul um and just just as a counterpoint like why i think that heroes are a bad idea including jesus christ really uh like like as i said earlier one can even one can turn anything into a trap and the dow that can be named is not the true dow etc right so i mean i have a picture of jesus christ on my wall and it does testify to something but you won't find me on my knees in front of it like i'm not that kind of christian i don't know if i'm any kind of christian i don't know but uh certainly it means something to me but what it means to me primarily is uh, by the grace of God, there go we all. Like potentially, that is the that's the only example to follow, and we can't really follow it again by looking outside of us. Well, Jesus isn't here, number one. I mean, he is and he isn't, but you know what I mean. He's not. He's not on the movie screen, thank God. So, so it's really the song. Although I think Mel Gibson's doing another. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> yes. Uh, turn away from the screen. Uh, yes. so, so, so to me that the end the the unified um goal of these forces of darkness human and otherwise is to um provide a counterfeit a counterfeit for the soul so we look outward to these heroes and we think we want what they've got because we don't really see what they're doing but the only thing that's re- we want to be great that was the thing i wanted to get to the the reason that we look to these figures and admire them and think they're great is because we ourselves want to be great, which is problematic. Because you could say none but God is great. But you could also say that it's it's also natural because we are great. We do have a connection to what that which is great. Uh, but the only thing, this is seen and not seen, that I had to find my way towards and I had to in the end and then I had to throw away Winnie the Pooh even like as the first temptation as a kid because all these things actually were counterfeits for the soul and I've just been trying to get back to my soul which is the only thing that will satisfy that yearning for a sense of wonder you know and of greatness so, so as I say all of these things in the end uh, are distractions sorry to say I've got all these books I'm still going to read them but really my best day is when I just go down to the lake here and, and sit in the sun and, and swim and get out and sun water sun water look at the sky and, and don't refer to anything except you know existence that those are the best days so, so I'm aspiring 
whether or not I ever have bees, to, to, to only rely on you know, nature itself, physical existence, to satisfy my soul, because then I think the soul really comes into its, into its own. Right? It's, that's the thing that feeds the soul, is, is you know, what God's provided. Culture, on the other hand, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's like Jesus in the desert. Right? You can have this, you can have that. Yeah, and Jesus is like, sorry, I'm not. I don't. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm cold, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take any of it. Well, um, uh, I, I'm. Tr- <laughs> I was gonna say not only yes, but H yes, uh, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm reminded of an old uh, Mormon friend of mine who would say, "Who would say not only yes, but hell yes." Oh, um, but, but, that's, but that's but that's probably not the appropriate answer. Uh, but it's the sentiment that I have, uh, which is uh, uh, yes twice uh, to what you're saying, uh, because oh. I think that you know it's funny because I'm looking at my picture right now and I have all of the I have these Guy Fox masks up like as sconces as a LARP. You know, I have oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have the assault pitchfork, which is a pitchfork painted black because we all know that weapons that are black are more dangerous than other weapons. Um, and and then I have a photograph that I shot in the 80s of volleyball players uh, playing volleyball on the beach. And all of the, 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 the things on my wall, with the exception of the cross, are either LARPs or hero worship, which is which is curious, you know, now, now I have to go back and look at my decorations, but, uh, uh, this, this talk has been uh, fascinating, uh, as usual, Jason, I, I really appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the work that you're continuing to do. Uh, uh, I, I likewise am going through a redefining, uh, of my life, but I, I don't think that it's a process that once you started, it ever really stops, uh, because you, you, it's not a rabbit hole as much as um, a garden of wonder. And as you start to kind of pull the curtains back, uh, the world uh, often looks more glorious than you thought that it was. That 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 pond sounds uh, delightful to me. Uh, it's the River Minho in Galicia. So it's a bit more than a pond. It's actually yeah. a reservoir. So it's kind of a, an odd example of something that's partly man-made, like man actually kind of improved something despite you know against all the odds it's like like you know we we do get some things right weirdly collect even collectively um but uh, on the other hand you know it's, is it worth the price of that but anyway no it's it's the menu um and it's very very nearby so uh, i just go there as often as possible uh, as i say as, a, as an alternative to distracting myself on the internet and as far as the work that i'm still doing actually I'm doing very little currently. Like talking to you is almost as close as I get. I mean, I, I am kind of writing actually, but that's that's just I don't seem to be able to quit. Um, but I'm not really. I'm hardly doing anything online currently. Uh, I don't know if that will change or not. But I stopped podcasting, and uh, I have put word out that I will run a men's group if there is interest because I've had some very good. Uh, continued positive experiences uh, doing a men's group, which you know, there's no ideological basis for it. It's just I've noticed that men do shine and come into them, come into themselves and express more freely when women aren't there. Sorry, I mean, it's, it's why your wife kept off camera, I think. <laughs> she prefers it that way, you know. Yeah, I um, like that too. Um, indeed. All right, well, um, uh, if people... Uh, so the best way for people to support you, I suppose, is to buy your books. Uh, well, that, that, I mean, I'm happy if they do that. that doesn't support yeah. me. Uh, but um, well, if I do run in any group, they can, if they're interested, let me know. Or that be by donation. I think one to ones. If anyone's interested in some of the deeper stuff I've talked about today and getting some guidance on that. And uh, audiobooks. I make audiobooks to make a little bit of change so I can keep buying more books about the Bible. I found that yeah. I can't really read the Bible and enjoy it much, but I do enjoy reading people writing about the Bible. So that's my indirect route. To uh, uh, v- very, very interesting. All right. All right, Jason. Well, thank, thanks for uh, joining me today. And yeah. 
do you, oh, uh, my my wife said, do, do you have a new book coming out? Yeah, Big Mother. That's Big Mother. Very soon, Big Mother, the technological body of evil. Uh, I would say that the Kubra Kong is kind of a warm up or a primer because I don't really get into the stuff that I really want to get into until Big Mother because it's a much broader uh, reach. And that's about, well, the female totalitarianism, the, the global super state AI, which I say uh, dovetails with the unconscious urge of traumatized men and I suppose women, but some more men uh, to recreate the mother's body, kind of like Ed Gein did, you know, the psychopath. Through all of this technology, it's similar to what Alison McDowell, I think, is exploring. Anyway, so that's out in October. So uh, I'll let you know when that's out. All, all right, terrific. And maybe we can we can do a show and pimp that. Um, for those out there in the audience, uh, the books that I have, Jason has lots of books, but uh, we were we were going to talk about the Kubrick Con today. Sometimes we talk about it. Uh, it's a great book, uh, uh, and uh, it's the reason that I reached out. But Jason also has. All right, we're uh, he, He's got Prisoner of Infinity. I got it though. Okay. okay. He's that got one's kind of particularly relevant now, Prisoner of Infinity, because I think they are finally trying to you know, uh, roll out the UAP program these days. So right. they, they, they keep trying. Uh, they I don't keep know. trying, but they yeah. seem, uh, uh, we'll see, we'll see. But Prison of is the only book I know of that really explores the, the social engineering aspects, which is incredible in itself. I mean, maybe there are other books and I haven't found them, but there's, there's so much to be uncovered around that. And it's incredible to me that people still buy that whole thing, but apparently they do. Indeed. Indeed. Well, with that, um, I will say um, uh, hasta la vista to everybody, and uh, and I will I will stop the recording. But uh, you and I can uh, finish up. So I'm going to stop the recording now. This is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world.